Okay, welcome everybody to the latest live streamed edition of the Scholar Gypsies. I'm delighted today to have Barrister and Senior Counsel Una McGurk to chat with me about the hate speech legislation and um, just some very recent comments by the Minister for Justice. But before I do that, um, I just want to remind people to click like, share, and subscribe to the Scholar Gypsies. The option should be below you there on YouTube. Um, if you want to support my work, there's links in the description and chat and all that stuff to um, to links to buy a coffee. I'm a writer as well. So if we could do that in the at West Awake at westawake.substack.com. Okay, so welcome, Una. I'm getting a little bit Thank of you, feedback Jerry. in my ear. Um, I suppose, Una, I just wanted to start today by asking you a little bit about the recent comments by Minister McEntee on the hate speech legislation. And are you surprised that people are still pushing this so hard, given the March 8th um, legislation and also the results of that and a lot of the political class are now against or seem to be against the hate speech legislation well jerry uh, i think it's clear that there is a significant pushback now uh, in respect of this legislation and i think that has occurred especially uh, since the um result of the march 8th referenda and the resounding no and a lot of politicians have suddenly had to reassess their positions on this uh, hate speech. And I think a number of Sinn Féin TDs uh, have now said that they actually will not support it, even though they voted in favor of it in the Doyle. So that shows you that the mood is changing because at last, after all these years, the politicians are beginning to sit up and listen to the people. So that's a really good thing. But notwithstanding that, uh, the uh, Minister for Justice, the current Minister for Justice, Minister McEntee was on, TV last week on RTE, and it seems clear from the comments that she made that she's still very keen to push and promote this uh, legislation. I don't know. I think that's probably the interview you're referring to. And yeah. essentially what she said in a nutshell, she said that um, it, she was concerned about the fact that we need to be catching up with the rest of Europe and that we're the only country in Europe that doesn't have any hate crime. Well, my response to that, Jerry, would be, so what? We don't need any hate crime here. There is no mandate for any hate crime. The Irish people haven't looked for this. And in fact, you know, with regard to this, this legislation started its life off in 2019. And at that time, there were submissions sought for members of the public as to how they viewed the proposals by the government at that time. And over 70% of the people indicated in those proposals that they didn't want this legislation but like so many other things that are done by this government they're ignoring the will of the people this is a growing concern and and this minister has effectively said the same thing she's only interested in what the rest of europe is doing not in the interests of her own people and there is no mandate from the gov from the irish people um, for the government to introduce this legislation. So it's really important um, to say that. So uh, what we have here, and, and I just want to talk briefly about this before we actually get into, into the legislation, is really this concept of what I see as the increased uh, federalization of Europe, where Ireland and other countries would be seen as satellite states you know, um, reporting back to the mothership in Brussels. And it's arguable that we're in that situation right now and uh, where we have ministers concerned about how it will be perceived in Brussels and whether or not they're carrying out their mandates or their functions for their, um, for their European um, masters, not for the people whom they are supposed to serve here. So, on that score, I think we what we actually need, and I think what this is leading towards, is really uh, where we should be having a debate on our membership of the European Union. Uh, I think it's the time that we reassessed where we are and do we really want this? Because um, 
you know, you have this growing um, dissent now because people are concerned that we seem to be losing uh, increasingly our sovereignty. And we've had that famous remark by Michal Martin when he was Taoiseach, who said that we don't want to have any Thing to do with this backward looking notion of sovereignty. And a lot of people are questioning as to whether or not this is really what we signed up for in 1973 when we became a member of, you know, what was then I think the EEC, and then we voted for all the various treaties in the meantime. So uh, the only issue, of course, with that is that this government are not likely to support such a public debate. And indeed, it's very likely that the next government will not support one either. But I do feel that there is a growing um, sort of concern there that we need to deal with this issue. And it's interesting that in that context, we have a minister publicly stating on our national broadcaster that we need to be catching up with the rest of Europe. So that tells you how she and the rest of the government feel when it comes to implementing legislation. And on that score, I just want to touch on briefly a piece of EU legislation, which is now effective here, which in a sense does relate to the proposed domestic legislation, which I promise I will talk about in a few moments. But this Digital Services Act, I think you've probably heard of that. Yeah. Um, it's currently in place. It's a piece of EU legislation. So it applies all across Europe. And essentially, it's about establishing clear rules for how online platforms can operate. And it's about harmonizing those rules. And it's designed to tackle illegal content online, which interestingly also includes illegal hate speech. So I feel that our government, and in particular this minister, wants to have this domestic legislation in place so it can dovetail with the overarching legislation of the EU, because every European state now has this hate speech legislation and the hate crime legislation. And then, as I said, that dovetails very well with the overarching um, Digital Services Act. Now, just on that, um, part of the process is that each country will have an enforcement wing, like a digital services coordinator set up in each country, reporting back effectively to the mothership in Brussels. So we have our Kamasun Naman here in Dublin, which is in Ireland, which is already up and running. And this Kamasun Naman has the authority to appoint trusted flaggers, they're called, and um, so for that, read fact checkers for Kamasun Aman. If you've read uh, 1984, think Ministry of Truth. So we're already here with regard to that. And these trusted flaggers can monitor and take down online content. So the overarching legislation is going to tackle censorship at a different level. In other words, at the platform level where they can remove content. And then the local uh, domestic legislation targets the individual. So you see how they're covering all their bases with both of these sets of, of uh, legislation. And as a consequence, what if they succeed in bringing about the domestic legislation, what you will have really is an overarching censorship grid you know, which covers every facet of, of what we can do. Now, um, on the, the Digital Services Act, which I've just described, violators who are the online platforms, I'm talking about Google and TikTok and Snapchat and YouTube and X, all these big platforms, they face very significant fines of 6% of their annual turnover if they are in breach of any of the rules under this act. And interesting, recently, the commissioner who was responsible for bringing in this act, his name is Commissioner Breton, last year when there were riots in Europe, he stated that, in effect, they could shut down platforms like TikTok and Snapchat and effectively shut down the internet. And there was uproar in Europe from all of these uh, human rights, digital um you know, human rights activists, and he eventually had to retract his statement because there was great concern that this is what they would do. But it shows you the mentality of mm -hmm. these people, and, and that's why I'm bringing it to your attention. So well, the just, other uh, thing just that's relevant... Just, 
Una, just sure. before you move on, I, I just have a quick question for you. So, in effect, are the le are the legislators trying to get the social media platforms to be the enforcers for them? Correct. Exactly. Okay. And they will be the enforcers because if they want to avoid paying very hefty fines, what they're going to do is censor material themselves. So you have censorship now will be operating at the platform level on top of what we yeah. ourselves as you know ordinary citizens and individuals will have to deal with when it comes to the domestic legislation so really it's all about censorship but of course it's um packaged you know with all this virtue signaling language that it's all about tackling illegal content and there are clauses in it which would uh, relate to the protection of children from human trafficking and all of that and of course that's very good and i don't think anybody would not support that but that's you know that's thrown in for good measure there's all the other stuff about how effectively platforms will censor themselves to avoid any um you know um sort of uh, any breaches of the legislation so that i think will be a concern go going down the line and there's just one other thing i want to mention with regard to this digital services act which as i said is already in place um in the event of a crisis which by the way will include um you know a health crisis or an emergency and for that you can read pandemic the mothership in brussels will instruct the social fl flaggers or the trusted flaggers and the and the social media platforms to enhance uh, their content tent, um, and their algorithms to ensure that only trusted information from trusted sources will be made available to online users. So they would be have the power to alter the algorithms and to alter the content of their platform out output to ensure that information that might be considered to be detrimental to the narrative or the propaganda that's being proposed. So this is how in future going down, there is a serious risk that a lot of the freedoms that we currently enjoy now with regard to how we uh, pr promote and manifest the truth of what's really happening may become curtailed. But it hasn't happened just yet, so we'll have to watch this space. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention and to the attention of uh, those who, who are listening at, at this moment in time. So back to, to what the minister said then. She said that um, we had to have uh, the hate crime, that we were the only ones in Europe who didn't have hate crime. She also said that we need to come in now into the digital world. So uh, what many people may not realize is that we do have existing legislation which criminalizes hate speech. It's the Prohibition on Incitement to Hatred Act of 1989. Now, that is quite a while ago. And I think if I can remember that far back myself, I don't think we had smartphones and I don't even think we had the internet. So, you know, the, the definitions that are in the act you could argue might not be specifically relevant to the digital age although i would argue that the the term the broadcast term is very is in itself very broad in the current legislation but what i would say is that it would be very easy to tweak the existing legislation to bring it into the digital age but i believe the real reasons why the minister wants to have the new proposed legislation is for very many other reasons, because in the existing legislation, uh, the prosecution have to prove intent. Uh, Jerry, are you still there? You've disappeared from my screen. I'm not sure you're still there, Jerry, are you? For a second, I'm back. Apologies, people, for that. Oh, that's no problem. You're back. So what I was just saying about the existing legislation, um, as you know, um, this is criminal legislation, which means that anybody who's accused of committing an offence under this legislation has to go through a criminal process. And anybody who is accused of a crime or accused of an offence is innocent until proven guilty. You've, you've heard of this concept before. It's a fundamental... 
uh, concept of our criminal justice system. So the prosecution have to prove intent. So um, that can be a difficult hurdle for them to overcome. And as a consequence, there are very few prosecution, there are very few convictions under the existing legislation. But in the Department of Justice website, they have indicated that one of the reasons why they want the new legislation is because uh, they need more convictions. So what I would say to anybody who is, expresses this, why would a government or a minister want to introduce legislation so that they can uh, procure or secure more criminal convictions against their own people? And so I mm -hmm. think that's a legitimate question to ask. But in the new proposed legislation, um, the, uh, the hurdle is not so great for the prosecution to overcome because now all that's required is that prosecution proves that the individual who's been charged with the offence uh, is reckless as to whether or not uh, the offence is being committed. So recklessness is now the new standard as well as intent. So it's either intent or recklessness. So that's a lower threshold. It's a lower bar for the prosecution to have to, to, have to overcome mm -hmm. if they want to have a prosecution. So I think that's these are probably the real reasons why the minister wants to have this legislation. And insofar as digitize, digitization is concerned, perhaps the real um, section in the new proposed legislation that deals with digitization is the famous section 15, which deals with search and seizure um, and gives extraordinary powers to the Garda Shia Kona, which I will be talking about in due course. And that section relates to the powers given to the Gardaí to seize, if necessary or if required, your phone or your computer. So in that sense, that significant section dealing with digitization is not, of course, contained in the existing legislation. So I believe these are the real reasons why the minister wants the, the new legislation. So to come now to the legislation, um, essentially uh, the bill, it's got a very... But just uh, before we... you move on, just before, sure. Una, just before you move on, um, I just want to have a question for you there. What, of course. Even, even as you outlaid it there, and I think what people are starting to see is is that you there the at the European level there is there are different webs of legislation that are kind of linking in together in terms of you know in terms of kind of um subliminally or silently kind of curtailing people's freedoms. You know, yes. we could throw in digital currency into that as well. We could throw into a few a few other things. Um, yes. I suppose people are starting to become more aware of this, you know, of these kind of directives coming in from Europe on hate, you know, on hate speech as you outlined there. But also on the Digitization Act, also on, you know, digital currencies down the road. Do you see it like that? Do you see that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. These like with the concept of the the the, C, the CBDCs, um, you know, if they're authorized by the European Central Bank and we have to implement those programs here, that would be very serious and significant because effectively it won't even be money; it will be tokenization. And you would you would be totally controlled. You will have you know artificial intelligence telling you that uh, you know you, if you go to the butchers and uh, you want to buy a steak and it will come up on your phone. Oh no no sorry you you bought a steak last week. Um you know you can we'll allow you to spend your tokens in the salad counter down the road or down the aisle. But no you've you've had your quota of meat now. So off you go and buy some uh, mealworms or crickets. Uh, if you want protein, uh, but not, I mean, that's if Klaus Schwab and the WF, WEF have their way. So this is the world, you know, that we're heading towards, like it's a potentially dystopian world and we don't want that. And, and I think people are beginning to realize that, you know, there are some potentially sinister agendas out there and we need to push back against them. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I suppose that takes us nicely. So if there's a bit of a delay on my end, it's because I'm getting some feedback in my ear, but I'm assured it's not affecting the stream on YouTube. But I suppose, um, you know, the, as we move into the hate legislation or hate speech legislation, we're, Ireland's, if this goes ahead, is going to have what's called a hate crime. And I suppose maybe take us, take us, start from that kind of concept and maybe work our way through it. Well, okay, yes. So, as I said, there's two two sections to the bill. The hate crime actually aspect is is the second. It's part two of what's contained in the bill. And what that involves really is is um, a number of offences. I think there's probably about twelve in all, which are already existing offences, but when they're aggravated by hatred. And if the prosecution succeeds in, um, you know, overcoming the threshold and securing a conviction, the person, the accused person, can be convicted of what's known as a hate crime. So the hate crime carries a higher tariff or a higher penalty. And that is what's significant about a hate crime. Also, if convicted of a hate crime, that person would be known as having been convicted of a hate crime. So you can imagine the consequences of that, especially if it's a young person and they want to try and get a visa because they can't get a job in Ireland because of the economic policies and they want to travel abroad. And or if they want to get a job even here in Ireland, you know, if you if you've been convicted of a hate crime, that's going to be very, very serious, very, very serious thing. And I suppose, uh, and that is the link it, it, where that where that integration act, or the sorry the digitization act is. It's going to make it a lot easier when you have the ideas of these kind of digital soldiers monitoring social media content, monitoring all sorts of things online, and and that 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 element of it is the two of them together are going to work very you know coercively against people feeling they're free to speak their mind on these platforms and Indeed. you know i know there's sure and i and i come to that i'll go back to part one in a minute but you've asked me to deal with the hate crimes so that's mm. in part two of the act so the important thing to remember that they're already existing crimes these crimes are already on the statute books so for example you have in the, in the new proposed legislation, you'll have an amendment to the current Criminal Damage Act. You will have an amendment to various Criminal Justice Public Order Acts. You will have amendments to the um, Non-Fatal Offences Against the Person Act, and that really deals with assaults. So you have a baseline offence, but if the prosecution can prove that it was aggravated by hatred, now bear in mind that hatred has not even been defined, and I'll come to that in a moment. And where you can, where the prosecution can can say that at the time or during or immediately after the commission of the offense of the offense, the person demonstrated hatred towards the victim. These, this will all be used by the prosecution to establish, to the satisfaction of the court, that you have indeed committed. A hate crime. So the demonstration test involves, you know, uh, words or slurs or gestures uh, accompanying the act. So if somebody, for example, is engaged in an assault and they, they're very abusive towards the victim and they say dreadful things, which I'm, I'm not going to repeat online now, but which could be construed as hatred, that will be used against them. And Given the fact that we do live in a digital era where so often now these types of incidents are filmed, people have their mobile phones. So if you are saying things and you might say terrible things in the heat of the moment, or maybe because you've had too much to drink or whatever, and you might be in a temper. So or whatever you say now, and if somebody has a mobile phone nearby, the chances are it's going to be recorded. And so what you say effectively will be used against you and potentially could constitute um, a demonstration of your hatred towards somebody. So the prosecution could use that against you 
in a prosecution, for example, for assault. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, so that's what happens. And so, I, I, so there's an increase in the penalty. That's that's basically the situation. Base offences aggravated by hatred or a demonstration test will be applied uh, to show that you were demonstrating hatred by your your slurs or gestures or whatever you said and you will um and and it's obligatory it's mandatory for a judge to apply the increased sentence but what is interesting about this and i need to say this in case i forget uh, and why i'm personally objecting to this whole bill because i used to work in the area of criminal law it's totally unnecessary judges already have inherent powers right now without this legislation to take into account aggravating factors or circumstances surrounding the commission of an offence. They don't need this legislation to do that. So I want to make that mm -hmm. point very clear. And I may come back to that in a moment, but if I could, I'll just go back to the part one of the proposed bill, which is the, the bill that the, the, the current Minister for Justice uh, wants to uh, to push through. So um, the relevant sections really, which I think would affect most people, I mean, with interpretation clauses, etc. Section 7, 7, 9, and 7, 8, 9, and 10. And I will go to section 15 as well. Remind me about that because that's a really important mm -hmm. one. Um, this section 7 is one of the principal uh, offences which will impact people and especially Irish people. Uh, because it's Irish people, it's the native indigenous Irish people who will be mostly impacted by the effects of this legislation because the legislation is designed to protect people who are members of minority groups who have what are known as protected characteristics. So there's a list of protected characteristics set out. What now, just one question. Like I, course, I've gone yeah. through the list. Of, I've gone through the list of protected characteristics, Una, mm -hmm. and what you might say about them in, in total is anyone could claim to be covered by one or two of them. You know, like it could be religious, it could be yes. um, race. So it, it leaves you in a situation that where anyone could make the claim that they're being targeted by hate speech based on how there's like yeah, they seem yes. so general do you do you do you see it that way or how do you see it just on I, the I, I i would i would agree with that yes and ultimately what this legislation is doing it's dividing people instead of uniting us we're being divided it's the age old divide and conquer put people in different categories, make them suspicious of each other. It's all, it's all designed to have a chilling effect on speech. Oh, I better not say that. Or um, I better not have my little boy, Johnny, play with Muhammad over there because, you know, they're, they're a family that would come within these protected characteristics. And, oh, gosh, if there was ever a row broke out or our Johnny could get into terrible trouble or if he beat up Muhammad or whatever, you know, a complaint could be made, we could all be investigated. And so you can see how this would, this would have the effect of polarizing society, dividing people, and it's placing essentially minority groups in a separate category. So the question to ask is why should people who have these protected characteristics, why should they be treated differently to everybody else? Are we not all equal before the law? And under our own constitution, we are. We, we're, we All citizens are held equal before the law. Under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think it's Article 7, everyone is equal before the law. Under the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, Article 20, we're all equal before the law. And generally speaking, people, you come before the courts, everyone's treated equally. Now, we're going to give a category of people more rights than others. So you may ask, why should people with protected characteristics enjoy greater protection than people without them? It's going to create a two-tier system of justice, two-tier system of victims. 
it makes no sense. And as I said, it, 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 you know, it's creating disunity and disharmony and confusion in society. And it's already starting to have a chilling effect where people will think one thing, but they'll be afraid to express it for fear it will offend somebody. Somebody will make a complaint and they or their family members could end up uh, undergoing an investigation. And even if it doesn't result in any kind of a conviction, the process that you have to go through, as anybody out there will know, if they've had, if they themselves or any members of their family have ever been investigated for a criminal offence, it's horrendous. The stress involved is unbelievable. It can break up families. It can destroy families. This is criminal legislation. So this is very serious. Uh, and I don't think that the minister who's bringing it in fully appreciates or realises the significance of what she's doing and how it could and negatively impact so many families. But, but back to section seven, uh, which is one of the main, main offenses, right? Which basically says it's the offense of incitement to violence or hatred um, where somebody communicates material to the public or a section of the public or behaves in public in a, in a manner with, that is likely to incite violence or hatred against a person or a group of persons on account of their protected char characteristics and does so with intent. Remember, intent to incite violence or is reckless, which is a lower threshold of proof. That's a much so that, lower threshold. It's much lower, much, much lower, and dangerously so, if, if I may say so. Uh, and that is what is of concern. And that's this is the new threshold now in the new legislation which doesn't exist in the existing one. You may recall I said that at the outset. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what we're dealing with. Now, if you're convicted of an offence under this section, I know you want me to deal with penalties. On summary conviction, you would be liable to pay a Class A fine, which is 5,000 euros, or 12 months in prison, uh, or a term not exceeding 12 months in prison, or both, or on indictment, a fine, a similar fine or imprisonment not exceeding five years. So what that means um, for your listeners is essentially if the facts, if the DPP who is responsible for um, instigating the prosecutions under this act decides that the circumstances of the offence are minor, the director of public prosecutions will direct that the case be dealt with in the district court before a judge. So that's a summary offence. If the DPP considers that the facts are more serious and warranted being dealt with in the circuit court, that's when the accused will be dealt with on indictment before a jury. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I was just about to so ask that, you about the difference between summary and The difference indictment between the two. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, summary offence and on indictment. So the penalties are obviously enhanced for, uh, well, and, and I and I would just ask or add and maybe ask is, you know, this is going to this this you know side issue completely is maybe that just going to put huge pressure on the court system. Like, you know, summary summary convictions in a district court that is already out of, you know, is almost chaotic um, with all the types of different um, criminal offences that are dealing with already. We'll say. Like there isn't, is there the capacity in the legal system to deal with this? I I don't think even so. If, well, even mean, if we all... said it's good, yeah. it's good. Even if we were to say and we're not at all, but even if we were to mm. say this piece of legislation was good, we're not. We don't have the structure. Like the courts, are the court systems? Um, no, I I don't believe we do. There are significant backlogs. Yeah, there are significant backlogs. I believe in all the courts. Our courts are not designed to deal with this type of legislation, which also means, of course, that if, if there's a prosecution uh, for anybody uh, under this legislation, and if there are delays, it means that these people are, could be waiting for months or years before the case comes to court, before they get an opportunity to clear their name. Can you imagine the stress of that on an individual and or their families? I mean, this is all completely unnecessary. For what? Really, at the end of the day, for what? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that that's that's my view. So um I I just don't think this is the way to deal with with 
uh, genuine hatred. If people experience genuine hatred, then they need help. They need, you know, psychological help to deal with that. Uh, prosecuting them is really not the answer. It's a very unenlightened way to deal with problems in society. You know, uh, introducing potentially draconian legislation mm -hmm. against people is not the way to make a society change or to bring about change in society. I don't think it's very enlightened. So Section 8 deals with, um, you know, condemnation or denial or trivialization of genocide. So if somebody tries to deny the existence of the Holocaust, for example, that would constitute an offence under Section 8. And then Section 9 mm -hmm. then deals with, um, or, Oh, and this is actually interesting. Section nine, um, it, it relates to the previous section I've just outlined with regard to communicating material that's likely to incite uh, hatred or violence. What is extraordinary about that section is that you can be convicted under section seven for inciting hatred or violence, even if you were not successful in actually bringing that about. Mm -hmm. So yeah. even if you failed miserably, uh, uh, the prosecution uh, uh, is there, um, yeah. the, the prosecution no, like, can uh, succeed in the conviction of Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does that does that make sense? One of the things, and I'm you're probably moving yeah. you're probably moving on to it now, Una, is that yeah. you know we also have what I'd classify the concept now of a, a thought crime. Uh, in sec in section ten, and I suppose we might get to the um, you, yeah. We might I'm just about to talk move, about section ten um, then. into yeah. that area as well. Yeah, All exactly. Right. So section ten uh, then um, you know describes an offence which again is likely to affect a, a lot of people. It's the offence of preparing or possessing material likely to constitute or incite violence or hatred against persons on account of their protected characteristics. So a person should be guilty of an offence under this section if they prepare or possess material that is likely to incite hatred or violence, and they do so either with intent or they are reckless as to whether or not the violence or hatred is thereby incited. So it's the same standard of, of proof there. And what's Interesting about uh, this particular section relating to what is essentially the possession of material or the preparation of material is that the burden of proof shifts. So you may recall at the outset, I spoke about the general burden of proof in a criminal trial always rests with the prosecution who have to prove the guilt of the accused person either to the satisfaction of a court in a summary offence or a jury in an indictable offence beyond a reasonable doubt, okay? So that's the burden of proof. But with regard to this offence that I've just described, which is the offence of possession mm -hmm. or uh, preparation of material, the burden shifts on you as an accused person to prove that uh, in circumstances where it's reasonable to assume that you would have been in possession of it, not for personal use, the burden then shifts where you have to prove that uh, you didn't have it for the purpose of inciting violence or hatred against a person or a group of pers persons on account of their protected characteristics. So that's very unusual and a lot of lawyers would object to that because it shifts the burden of proof, which is unusual in a criminal um, mm -hmm. case and in criminal legislation. This is not normal. So this is making it more difficult effectively for people to establish their innocence if in fact they've been charged with an offence under this section. And what is also interesting about this section is the potential uh, for businesses to be criminalized. For example, if you were a printer or um, a publisher and you were asked to produce flyers or leaflets or posters for um, an online event or a rally or a meeting of some sort, and 
you could find yourself being investigated uh, under this section if the content uh, could be construed or deemed to incite violence or hatred against a group of people or a person, even a person or a group of persons on account of their protected characteristics. And bear in mind, all it requires is for one person or a group of persons with these characteristics to make a complaint about you. And once the complaint has been made to the Garda Shia Khanna, for example, the Gardaí are obliged to investigate the complaint. So whether or not they proceed with it and whether or not it proceeds to a, to a prosecution or a conviction, there is the investigation process, which in itself can be very harrowing for people. So these are the situations and circumstances which the Irish people mainly, uh, although there are other people as well who would be affected by this, obviously, are facing if this legislation is enacted. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, it's no, it's great to get it's it's great to get it to to go through it there in detail for people because I think one of the things is people do are not um, aware of the detail and of just aware of how you know um, draconian you know it is the when you go through it like, the legislation like you know yeah. one of the uh, um um penalties i suppose we'll get to that point now maybe is is in like section 15 with search warrants and, yes and i'm just coming um, to that yeah 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 and, so and yeah this legislation interestingly and it was described recently by a barrister who was i saw interviewed he's an international barrister and lorcan price is his name and he described the legislation as pernicious mm -hmm. and i thought it was a very very good description for it uh, it's pernicious and it's really, you know, it, it's like a minefield. It's designed to trap you on so many levels. And as I said, it's going to create disharmony, disunity, polarization in society. This isn't, it's not an enlightened policy and this isn't really where we want to go. And I think that's why there's such a pushback against it, especially from, you know, very seasoned um and enlightened observers and practitioners, like for example, Senator Michael McDowell, who, who's a very experienced jurist and, and a very experienced criminal barrister himself. I mean, he can see the potential pitfalls um, in this, as can many other lawyers as well. Mm -hmm. So anyway, now on to section 15, which is um, a section that has caused a great deal of concern to many people who are, um, you know, pushing back against this, uh, not least and including the the independent senators of which, uh, you know, Senator McDowell is one and the new Senator Keoghan, Senator uh, Ronan Mullen. They, they have been very instrumental in delaying the process really in the Shannon, which has been very significant. And I know they would have great concerns about the um, about this section 15 that I'm going to describe to you. So. This is the section which deals with um, extensive powers given to the Garda Shia Khanna with regard to search and seizure. So what can happen is that a member of the Garda Shia Khanna can swear an information on oath before a district judge and uh, obtain a warrant to search premises where they reasonably believe that there is material or information that they require in order to investigate an, an offence or where they feel that an offence uh, an offence has been committed or is about to be committed in relation to any of the offences under this act. So, um, so having obtained the, the search warrant, uh, this member, uh, who by the way could be just someone straight out of Templemore, you know, and if somebody makes a complaint to them that somebody has this material in their possession in their house and that really this member should should go there and uh, get this material and investigate whether or not, um, you know, uh, offences under the Act are liable to be committed. This member can go at any time to the premises, the subject matter of the search warrant, either on his own or her own, or accompanied by others. They can go anytime. They don't have to give any warning of their arrival. 
they could arrive when you're having uh, your family over for dinner, you're having a child's birthday party, you could be having a meeting, you could have your family over uh, for dinner, you could be having a party, they can arrive. And they have extensive powers of search and um, seizure. And they can take uh, not only your um, hardware, such as your phone or your computer, but that of anybody else that's in your house. This is the Which, now, hmm. yeah. This, this, this is. We're now getting into an area where people are not aware of just yeah. exactly what could happen. Like you could have a, you could have a, you know, a birthday party. There could be thirty people in your house, and the search warrant actually exactly. covers all thirty people in your house. Correct. And the the the, the guard in question has the authority to to examine the person as well as the content of their computer. Or their phone they can take any material that they deem necessary uh, for the purpose of the investigation they can ask you for your password for example if you refuse to give your password to either your computer or your phone and the guard in question wants it you have committed an offense and you will automatically be found guilty of um, uh, an offense where you will be subject to a class a fine which is 5,000 euros and or a term of imprisonment not exceeding 12 months. So if you refuse to give your password for your phone or your computer when requested to do so by a member of Angarda the Shia Connor who comes to your house, could be a dawn raid, and they're looking for this information, that is the fine, that, that is the penalty that you will suffer. In addition to that, if you obstruct the Gardaí or even attempt to obstruct them in, the, in their powers of um, search and seizure under this section, you will likewise be guilty of that offence. If you even refuse to give your name and address when asked by a member of the Garda Shia Kona, you will be guilty of this offence and you could uh, suffer penalty of 12 months imprisonment or and or a class a fine of 5000 euro that's uh, like th that's amazing to, like it's just amazing to me that it is amazing um, that there isn't more outrage on that publicly by our political class and our media class but i suppose it brings up a question and it's a slight diversion to what you're talking about there but recently i i interviewed a, a Fianna Fáil politician whose house was raided whose phones were taken and or his phone was taken but all of the phones of the people in the house were investigators on the on the on his in his home so what i would say is the power the again the existing powers that are in place are are they are they not enough for the um, the Garda Shikana and the Minister for Justice? Indeed, and that's a very legitimate question. It seems that they already have those powers, as they exercised them recently in the case of that politician, and that was clearly sending a message to others who who uh, mm -hmm. were were not prepared to agree with what the powers that be want them to agree with. And yes, why do they need even more powers under this legislation? Absolutely. But these are very draconian powers. And the problem is they are open to being abused. abused yeah. You know, of course, there are guardi out there who would exercise their discretion and maybe not exercise those powers or not utilize them. But you cannot be sure of that in all circumstances and all situations. And it's really not healthy for a nation that you have these very serious powers, uh, you know, available to the Gardaí, which could be abused. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't I should, support it at all. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted your train of thought there. I don't know if you were, no. were going to continue on there. No, not really, uh, just other than to say that this is... Um, this is indeed uh, very draconian, and uh, it, it was just in, in response to your your concern that you wondered why more members of the media and or politicians, you know, didn't object to this. What I suspect really is that they're unaware of it, and I think that if more politicians had maybe read the act or were realised that um, 
these powers uh, were being given to the uh, Garda Siakona under this section, that they would have objected to the bill or they might have proposed more amendments. So I, I suspect that's the reason why. But um, I think maybe now they're coming to realise that um, these powers do exist. And uh, again, it's not a healthy situation for anybody to be in. I mean, you could be visiting a friend, uh, you know, and, and there's a, a raid. Uh, and the guard the Shio Kona come to the house to, and they're there ostensibly to 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 obtain information uh, or documentation, passwords, or seize the the hardware of your friend. But if they ask you, and who are you, and uh, you know what's your name and address, and you say, well, it's none of your business, and I'm not going to tell you, which would, in a sense, be an understandable response in the circumstances. Straight away, you're guilty of an offence under the section. And you're liable to a class A fine of five thousand euro and or term of imprisonment of twelve months. And of course, what happens uh, with regard to the seizure of um, hardware like phones or computers? This could be devastating and detrimental to people who rely on on this hardware, maybe for their living. If you were a writer or a broadcaster, and your your phone was taken. And your computer was taken, you, you, you wouldn't be able to uh, continue to earn your living. And as I said earlier, investigations can take a long time and it can take a long time for cases to come before the courts. And it can take a long time, and I know this myself from having been in practice before, evidence that's taken legitimately by the, the Gardaí in the course of an investigation to be returned. So you can see the consequences the potential consequences of this are are enormous and i don't think anybody has really really thought this through uh, absolutely not and when you think of all the aside from what they may be looking for on your phone in terms of the in cyber hatred the amount of confidential information that is on people's phones is, that would be separate yes. to you know whatever offense they're trying to either pursue or jimmy up or whatever is like from a league yeah. you know you uh, of course again I mean, um, it, it puts people our phones in are our lifelines now and well, we unfortunately need them. yes yeah it, it, that is mm -hmm. true i suppose when i want to bring you to a point i suppose this is kind of off topic a little bit but you know a lot of people won't be aware but i just wanted to give people a bit of background is like your your career you're a senior counsel since 2004 you were yes. the, um you were the former chairperson of the irish red cross the youngest in the world at the time i i believe right. you've also been on the peace and reconciliation forum for northern ireland going back to the 90s um precursor to the good friday agreement you have a huge career in the legal arena and yes you found yourself in 2020 effectively cancelled and I, I i know you don't talk to like talking too much about it but i, I thought maybe uh, uh, to get a flavor of what that felt like for you to go through at the time and how was it like what was the effect have you been able to deal with it you know etc well it was in many respects a horrific experience and i certainly wouldn't want i wouldn't wish it on anybody really and it it came as a complete shock and surprise to me because i was asked to speak at a rally in um, dublin in august of 2020 and this was um you know a rally or an assembly organized to object to government restrictions uh, because it was considered by many, including myself, that there was significant overreach by the government with regard to the, the various the legislation and the manner in which they were uh, conducting themselves during uh, COVID. So I was asked to speak uh, on this issue and it was my day off and uh, I was happy to do it at the time. And I said, yes, uh, I will do it. I was asked to speak on the mandatory wearing of masks and because i have a very eclectic background you know i've studied geopolitics in in um switzerland uh you know i have um I, i'm a qualified um holistic dietitian transformational life coach i have extensive qualifications in areas other than law and uh, i have been doing research for years and years and years into a lot of different areas, include and I've you know been engaged in medical negligence cases and I've sat on a number of high-powered um, 
quasi-judicial tribunals. So I had extensive experience in a lot of areas that would have been very relevant to what was happening during COVID and would have informed my views on that. And I feel that, I mean, just like everybody else, I was entitled to have a view, but I had done the research. So I spoke against the mandatory wearing of masks, which um, I was deeply concerned about because I knew they were coming down the road for children. And, um, you know, whilst I had no problem with people wearing masks and I have friends, I had friends who wore masks because it made them feel safe. And I totally understand that. And, and that and that was uh, uh, of course, something that they're entitled to do, but it was the mandatory wearing of masks that I had a major concern with because of all the potential consequences, you know, restricting breathing, restricting ox oxygen intake, increasing the carbon dioxide levels of the body, which would lead to all sorts of problems, which I highlighted. And many uh, very, very renowned doctors and scientists had spoken out very, very strongly about the use of masks. I was also aware that they, the government were going to promote them, them and that Professor Luke O'Neill was intending to promote them for school children, which was a source of serious concern for me, to me. And it's very interesting that the Cochrane study has proven that in fact I was correct and that there is evidence to suggest that children's cognitive abilities uh, were um, adversely impacted as a result of them having to wear masks during that time. But I spoke about that issue. I also spoke about another important issue, which I felt was used as the foundation for the lockdown, which namely was the flawed, fraudulent PCR test. And I was aware that the man who had invented that test, a man called Carey Mullis, he actually got the um, Nobel Prize for uh, inventing the PCR test. He had stated specifically that this test was not to be used to test for an infection. Now, mysteriously, he died just two to three months before COVID broke out. But I was conscious that our government, and as indeed all other governments, because they were all in lockstep all over the world, as was designed to be the case, were using this flawed process to um, lock down the, the country, to create cases based on uh, alleged COVID in order to lock the country down. Now, what we do know about the test, that insofar as you would even consider using it, the CDC in the States had indicated that it should never be used with magnification cycles above 25. But in Ireland, they were using magnification cycles of 45, which meant that the vast majority of the test results would have been false or flawed. So therefore that most of the uh, positive results would have been false positive. So our government were locking down a nation based on a flawed, fraudulent process called the PCR test. Now, I didn't go into that detail at the rally, but I spoke about it because I felt there should be public debate about these issues and that the Irish people, not just the Irish people, anybody who was on Irish soil, that included asylum seekers and immigrants and anybody who was in the country because everybody was being affected by these um, draconian legis regulations, uh, that we should know about these things. And I wanted to stimulate a debate on it. I didn't have any other forum in which to do that. So essentially following that, um, uh, two government ministers on the following morning. I don't know, do we have time to this? Can we yeah, go yeah, over? Yeah, absolutely. No, over, no, no, we, we abs absolutely. Over the time. I, no, um, I'm, I'm very interested in this, yeah. No, oh, thank you. So I, I didn't speak for very long because I was, actually asked to only speak for five minutes so i curtailed the speech to to make it just a short speech and uh i was really shocked the next day when i discovered that uh, you know um there were serious concern raised about my attendance at this at this rally and i discovered subsequently that hazel chu who was the lord mayoress of dublin had tweeted about me the night before uh, uh, effectively condemning my presence at the um at the rally this was taken up by uh, minister rodrigo gorman the following morning as uh, sunday morning and he started tweeting about me and uh, helen mcintyre the minister for justice so they were tweeting amongst each other publicly about this um barrister who had spoken 
out at this rally. Now, what's very interesting about the approach that all of them took was that nobody made any reference to a single word that I had spoken about. And it was quite clear to me subsequently that the reason for that was because I was over the target and they did not want any discussion about those issues or topics. So they had to shut me down. So they had to find an angle which they felt they could utilize, which would work against me. So I was at that time a member of a tribunal uh, known as the International Protection Appeals Tribunal, which is the tribunal that deals with appeals by asylum seekers looking for international protection. It's which otherwise known as, <laughs> as it is now. Yeah, it was otherwise known as IPAT. But at the time, nobody knew about that tribunal. Nobody had heard about it unless you were actually actively involved in the system. You wouldn't have known about that. And Anybody who had heard me speak at that rally wouldn't have cared less what I did or what tribunal I was on. Was or only, what my background. There was only one story in town in 2020, and that was COVID. Yes, there was no it one was talking COVID. About it. Yeah. Exactly. Immigration mm -hmm. wasn't even an issue at all for any anybody. But, but I think it's important to state that I never dealt with immigration matters. I have nothing to do with immigration. That dealt with by the alien section of the Department of Justice. It translates into government policy. I have had and still have nothing to do with immigration. What I was dealing with at all, at all times in my professional capacity was simply uh, international protection um, applicants who were asylum seekers looking for international protection. It's a completely different area. But the people who jumped on the bandwagon uh, afterwards deliberately, I feel, conflated the two, which uh, was very confusing for the members of the public, I'm sure, who were uh, looking on. But, but essentially, what concerned me about the two ministers who started publicly tweeting about me was uh, I thought this was so unseemly and undignified for two senior government ministers to be publicly tweeting about a senior counsel who was exercising her um, right to freedom of expression and speaking out at an event on a Saturday afternoon in her own spare time. They felt that they felt that they needed to do it publicly. Uh, I take the view that the minister had no right. She called for a public, um, an urgent inquiry into my behavior, you know, giving the impression that I had done something terribly wrong. So this looked very bad. And obviously all these tweets and all the, the um, newspaper articles which resulted and which came on foot of the... Um, the inspirational tweets by the two ministers are still there online. So if you Google me, you'll come across all this nefarious information. So it, it really sent a message that it's open season for Una McGurk now. You can really write anything you want about this lady. So, Well, I can, uh, let, I'll put it, I'll frame it this differently. I'll frame it this way is that, you know, I can, I can understand 100% why they needed to shut you down quickly. Because a you I mean in the sense of that here we have um, a senior counsel, per, a person of huge standing. They've got little or no. They have sketchy or little or no science backing up these lockdowns. The, yes. The public are the public don't know what which it, it wouldn't have taken much to back you up. We'll say uh, a few other voices, especially in 2020. Um, and they panicked and like not panicked, but like they came down, they came, they were always going to come down hard because they needed to, I'm trying to find a better way of this, say this, but they needed to shut you down quick yes. in case, in case what you were saying starts to make traction in the general population. Would you see it? That's like absolutely, that? that's absolutely correct. So they were prepared. So as a consequence, I effectively lost my career and it's a long, uh, you know, and I got cancelled. And there were all these articles written about me in mainstream media. They fell somewhat short of defaming me, but I was called a conspiracy theorist because I wrote about 5G or did a video on 5G. 
5G is very real. It's a serious concern for the health and welfare of everyone on this on the on this on the planet and also this nation. There's nothing conspiratorial about the dangers of 5G. What I was called a conspiracy theorist because I had done a video on 5G. So the, the content of the articles was extremely disrespectful. And I believe that the actions of the two ministers was also very disrespectful to me as a senior counsel because I was just like anybody else, I was entitled to have that, that opinion. And I didn't take those opinions out of fresh air. I didn't make them up. I had done a significant amount of research to back up my opinions. But the reason why I'm even talking about this is that I don't want this to be about me at all. Yeah, but yeah, this yeah. could have been anybody, Jerry. Any any person in Ireland, any citizen could have suffered uh, a similar fate who spoke out. So it, it was designed to have a chilling effect, I believe, also on my colleagues. Look what happened to this um, barrister. In case anybody else thinks that they can step out of line, uh, you, you be very careful because this is what we can do. And, and ultimately, um, the two ministers, uh, or certainly one minister, definitively took action which, um, in which uh, she decided she wasn't going to renew my contract. That was the Minister for Justice in the following um, February. Now, that is the prerogative of the minister, and I accept that she has those powers. And she gave a number of reasons as to why she wasn't going to do that. One of them I can't really discuss because it's potentially some judiciary. Uh, absolutely. The subject matter yeah. of proceedings I'm involved in, but one of them is interesting and it's instructive, and and I, and I will talk about it because, again, it shows an attitude which is very relevant to the um, discussion we've just had about the uh, proposed legislation. Because if this government could do what they did to me without this legislation, mm, what, what will they do if mm -hmm. this legislation is enacted? to mm. anybody who disagrees with their opinions or any dissenters whatsoever. So this is why it's it's important. But um, if I just may get the, the letter of the minister during that um, period of time when I was effectively suspended and, and the report on me was being bandied around the place and was languishing in the office of the attorney general, I attended an online conference where I expressed my views about the, the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab, and I expressed concern about them and what they had intended to do and their transhumanist agenda, which was very worrying, especially in the context of the proposed hate speech legislation coming down the road of the government. And I made some comment that, you know, we're looking here at potentially at, you know, as we know, predictive programming is very real, a potentially a potential minority report situation where the thought police, you know, will arrive at your doorstep if people are, are uh, subject to um, microchipping, which we are, they are at the moment. Which, ostensibly, yeah, well, we've already seen it with Musk's, Musk's yes, companies. Yes, uh, it's there ostensibly it, to monitor your health, but it also monitors your blood pressure. It also gives information about heightened emotional states which could in the future be abused and misused against you to determine that you're in a heightened emotional state when speaking to your neighbor and therefore you might be at risk of causing them harm. So that was the essential, um, you know, the, the essential theme of that particular movie. So yes, it might, hopefully it won't happen, uh, but it, it was a potential dystopian uh, outlook that we need to be very careful of and we need to be very mindful of because as you say these factors are now in place so everything that's being done to bring this about it's always done step by step by step so little by little your freedoms are being encroached upon little by little there's more and more increasing censorship until eventually you know you're right in the grid and you've no means of escape. But back to what the minister said. In any event, I spoke about 
these types of events, I, I didn't realize that I was being monitored or that the information about what I was saying was going to be reported back to the minister, but it was. And they quoted some of what I said and um, the comment made by her uh, private secretary who was writing on her behalf um, was as follows, and I'm going to quote this. Furthermore, the minister is concerned that your comments as quoted above in relation to hate speech legislation is contrary to government policy in an area for which she herself is responsible. So mm -hmm. there I was expressing a view at a time and in circumstances where I was under the impression, again, that I had the right to freedom of expression uh, as espoused in my constitution. But, Again, just before you do, just I'm sorry, because yeah. uh, I, just what you read out there, it's curious she didn't say what you were saying was wrong. She said it was contrary to government policy. Yes. Which is and an interesting way to. It is an interesting that. thing to say. And, and given the fact that I and everyone else who was sitting on the tribunal at that time and uh, still, even to this day, would be under the illusion that they are independent in the performance of their functions because it's an essential criterion in order to be appointed onto a committee like that is that you know whatever your views are about certain things that you are independent in the performance of your functions which means that you don't um subscribe you don't have to subscribe to government policy or you don't have to implement government policy yes you have to implement legislation that exists of course that's completely different but you're under no obligation to really you should be under no obligation to agree you're with not a, legislation yeah but you're not you're not on an independent committee in our tribunal to promote government policy correct do you know what, <laughs> no matter whether you're a barrister or whatever whatever the forum might be it's on a specific focus and the reason you're on it is for your independence uh, it, the reason you're on it is for your separation from the government surely yes yes indeed and uh, you know yes uh, absolutely just but it, it was quite an extraordinary thing uh, to have been said uh, on behalf of the minister so that basically you know you don't agree with my legislation so there's no room for you on my tribunal so for all those barristers out there who think that they are independent and they can be independent and have their own views about things and still uh, retain their positions they might just be in trouble with this government if the word got out that well actually maybe they don't agree with government policy or maybe they're against the hate speech legislation yeah so it One, shows an attitude which i think is just it's not very healthy no. and you know and and it is is a, a concern for me and then with regard to the green party because uh Roderick, minister rodrigo borman as you know is a, a Green Party minister, and uh, he was one of the two um, ministers tweeting about me publicly. Publicly, again, why did they have to do it publicly? If anybody had a concern about what I was doing, they could have contacted me privately or contacted IPAT, or but well, no, this had to, had to like, be done publicly. Quick, but it had to be done publicly. Like I'm just and going quickly. through this and quickly, and, and quickly. Then, like that. That's that's it. Like there was no. They were never going to give you due process, right? You know no, I mean? like, no, <laughs> no, definitely not. I was going to going to be shut down. So. Then it was, uh, uh, there was a development then um, on behalf of the Green Party when uh, the following day, uh, literally within 24 hours of uh, Minister O'Gorman tweeting about me and expressing concern and saying he was keeping in touch with the Minister for Justice in relation to this issue, the Meath East Green Party chairperson is a man called Adrian Smith and I don't know him and I don't know anything about him he published a letter on Twitter on their Twitter uh, account as Twitter as it was then uh, because we're talking about uh, August of 2020 and uh, it was a letter a very serious letter which called for the minister of minister for justice to um to um, terminate my membership of uh, IPAT with immediate effect, um, effectively. So, um, but what was interesting about this is that um, 
it was clearly drafted. This letter was clearly drafted by a lawyer or someone with significant legal experience. And we all know that solicitor's offices don't open on Sunday. Can't get a barrister to do anything for you unless they're your best friend. So I don't know who crafted or drafted this letter, but whoever did so did it with a significant knowledge of the operation of the International Protection Act of 2015, also the code of conduct. So whoever drafted this or crafted this was in the know. Now, I don't know of Adrian Smith as a solicitor. I can't find any reference to him or what he does for a living. There is no available information about him online that I can find. All I know is that he's a chairperson of the Meath East Greens. I don't think he's a solicitor. Maybe he is. Maybe he drafted this letter himself. I don't know. But what I think it would be reasonable to assume uh, that whoever crafted or drafted the letter, that uh, the Minister for Integration, Roderick O'Gorman, would have been well aware of this letter. I don't think this letter would have been published or well, they wouldn't have gone on a solar run. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? You, you, it is unlikely they went on a solar. Like it's uh, it's unlikely the Meath East or whatever yeah. it was, a Green yeah. Party went on a solar run without their minister opinion on the matter like do you know like Indeed. I I mean, he, he's, he's a senior minister in the party and the interesting thing about the constituency where the letter was published is that it's the constituency of the minister for justice mm -hmm. so Very you had the two ministers tweeting that. publicly in a sunday morning and then within 24 hours this letter appears and uh, you know, it, the letter is still on the website, by the way, anybody can read it. And it's very interesting because here's what it accuses me of, that um, I was speaking at a public rally organized by far right groups, not true, which was advertised by and attended by a host of extremist groups on the far right, not true, with a history of overtly racist rhetoric, not true and to have called for an end to immigration into Ireland in all forms, not true, is a choice that creates a re reasonable apprehension of bias. So well, that's I just, just an comment example on that. of the kind of rhetoric that was put out there about me. Yeah. That that's very interesting because that that to me has in that to me has NGO fingerprints on it because the term far right in 2020 was not in common usage in Ireland. Yep. Be uh, it it became common towards maybe the end of 21, 22, and now we are, we're all far right now. But back in 2020, that terminology again, a bit like the asylum stuff, it was it was going on. But even like I wasn't put it like this. I I, I thought it was waking and up to things in 2020, but I wasn't really aware of the asylum issues. Even the far right terminology was an American thing. It was certainly a big deal in the US with the presidential election of 2020. But um, I suppose the question I want to ask you, maybe following on from that train, train of thought, and this is just your own personal opinion, given what you've been through. Do you think those two ministers in particular had an inkling of what was coming down the train on immigration and asylum seekers at that point? Or do you think the the institutions of the state had knew what was coming on, you know, the asylum seeking? We all know what the asylum seeking uh, seeker issues are and re refugee stuff is now. But do you think it was yes. even back then, um, kind of in 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 plot? I do, I do. I think they knew exactly what was coming down the line. I can't prove it, but I just think all the what they were doing and their reactions uh, would certainly indicate that. And it's very interesting what you say about the concept of far right, because that was, I thought, what's that? What does that mean? Uh, I'm far right. <laughs> who are these far right people? Who are they? I, 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 I was really shocked. Wait a minute. I was speaking about masks and PCR tests. I was there on behalf of Health Freedom Ireland. I was with two other speakers. Uh, Dolores Cahill, who was there in her capacity as a scientist, and Marcus de Bruyne, who was there as a GP. They wanted a doctor, a scientist, and a lawyer to speak about those issues. But the Yellow Vest movement, the, the, the rally was held in association with the Yellow Vest movement. So there were other speakers um, speaking about a variety of issues, but they were all essentially concerned with 
uh, with government restrictions uh, in relation to the lockdown process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, Irish flags. There were people carrying Irish flags, which seems to be now, um, you know, uh, something the government really doesn't like. Are you flashing the tricolour anywhere? Uh, this doesn't fit well or sit well with this. Oh, we don't want to have anything to do with this backward looking idea of sovereignty. So put away your tricolour flags now and let's just display the EU flag. So when people with that mindset see people who have tricolours, I think it makes them very nervous. Well, I think you were at the like that rally was probably the most, you know, if we look back on it now, that was a very significant rally because it was the only rally we actually, you know, I say we, but it was the only rally that got the numbers on the street. So, like, if you look back at it, it was you, you really walked into the middle of, you didn't, like, you, you, if you were, if you were doing that today, you'd probably ask a few questions about, given what we know about the state apparatus and how they probably, that rally probably had some infiltration from, you know, NGO type protest groups who were kind of probably masquerading in the crowd so that they had that immigration group that they could sling the mud at you at from the from the um from the sidelines or whoever it might have been that said the controversial thing yes i i think that's probably very likely but i mean what happened took me completely by surprise i as i said because i was just speaking about unrelated matters I, I would never have spoken about immigration matters and like i i didn't know i i subsequently discovered that some of the people were members of the irish freedom party but i didn't know any of them at the time and they weren't there speaking in their capacity as members of the irish freedom party and that's very significant i mean i had political affiliations as well which nobody bothered to uh, 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 you know, you. ask any questions about, but I wasn't there uh, in my capacity mm. as uh, someone who was formerly associated with Fianna Foyle, actually, would you believe? That was irrelevant. So suddenly these people who uh, were connected with the Irish Freedom Party suddenly became very relevant uh, what their political affiliations were. So that was information that was really being used against me to paint a picture that really was biased and it wasn't accurate because as I said, the people who were there who happened to have affiliations with that party were not speaking on behalf of the party or about those matters. They were speaking about other matters. And as far as I know, the uh, I don't know what the situ situation is now, but at that time, the, the Irish Freedom uh, Party just believed in, in controlled immigration, similar to the uh, Australian points mm -hmm. system. So, you know, to see that the remarks that are being made here by the uh, Mead East um, mm -hmm. people who put this, um, tweet up it, it simply just doesn't make sense but it seems it seems like they didn't want any obstacle in their way or any potential obstacle in their way for what they felt was coming down the line so reading this information it would tend to support your theory that uh, this certainly minister o'gorman knew what was coming down the tracks um that's all i'll say and interestingly enough, with regard to that rally as well, which I think it's important to state, um, the Irish Times, which at the time I considered to be the paper of record, reported, I think that there was either four or 500 people at the rally, as did RTE. I can tell you there was a minimum of probably seven and a half thousand people at that rally. There yeah. was an extraordinary a number of people. So, you know, there you have your disinformation uh, already. And they also reported that there were scuffles at the rally. And no scuffles took place either at the rally or within the cordon of the rally. But there were scuffles that took place uh, outside the cordon where apparently people became aware that Antifa groups were intending to come and disrupt the rally but they were um, apprehended before they got to the rally. So there were no um, scuffles or anything of that nature. It was an extraordinarily peaceful rally. I mean, there was a beautiful Italian singer who sang Nessun Dorma. 
uh, there was a one minute candlelit vigil for all the people who had died alone in the care homes. It was a very a dignified event on so many levels. And that's why it was just such a shock for me to experience the reaction of both of the two government ministers and indeed the media subsequently, because it was completely at it was completely at odds with the reality of the situation. And as well, I said, we, it was completely misreported. Well, we've seen so many more examples of that in the intervening years as well, yes, you know, on yes. different subjects. One last question, Una, I want to get you, I want to ask this to you, um, and we're, we're going an hour and 20 there. Um, do you see what's going on, you know, in the general scheme of things in Ireland as a kind of um, like I'm coming more and more to the conclusion that there is a spiritual element to this, that, you know, w as much as we're fighting politicians, legislation, outside influences, um, you know, like the WEF or the UN or the EU, that we're, we're, we're in a sense in a fight for to protect or preserve the soul or spirit of the nation. Do you feel, yes. do, do, do you feel I in, do this, in feel that, that, in that very terms? strongly. I, I think really uh, there's a spiritual battle going on, um, you know, all over the world. And it really manifested in, in the whole COVID pandemic situation and, you know, the draconian measures that were taken by all governments. I feel there was a reason for that. It was designed to um, prepare us for what was coming down the line, which is not very pretty. And certainly we can talk about that in due course. But what is really wonderful for me to see is that, especially in the last few months, and I think this was really made manifest, um, with the recent referenda result is that the spirit and the soul of the nation has risen again. Actually, yeah, it's almost. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm on the same path with Jesus because I think that brings result... me to tears because I had wondered where it had gone and it's back again. And that soul, that fighting Irish spirit sort of I feel that the goddess Aru has arisen again and is influencing the Irish and they're suddenly standing up and saying enough is enough. They want their politicians and their government to represent their interests. They're no longer satisfied to have a government that's captured by, that's clearly captured by external influences. We're talking about Leo Varadkar and others who make their trips on a regular basis to get their instructions from the WEF. I mean, they must really think we're stupid if we can't see what's going on. I mean, the, the, the information is out there about the WEF. It's not a conspiracy theory. You know, these are facts that many Irish people need to become aware of, but they won't get that information on the national broadcaster and they won't get that information from the fourth estate who no longer are holding our public representatives to account. I mean, there was a time when I grew up, Jerry, that the fourth estate, namely the media, did hold politicians to account. That's no longer the case. They are now a propaganda arm of the government. And that's very sad and very uh, unfortunate. But thankfully, a lot of people are wakening up to that fact. So I feel that the soul and spirit of Ireland is has definitely awoken. So long may it continue so that we find, so that we get back our power to hold the current power interests in the company which in the country which are represented by the government we hold them to account and the way we do that is by speaking truth to power and if everybody does that it will make a huge difference because ultimately we will change the zeitgeist and that's what it's all about and as i said that process started just before the referenda, the recent referenda. The result was phenomenal. And I think it has given a lot of um, impetus and, and energy to the, the spirit and soul of the Irish people 
uh, at the moment. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I'm delighted to see it. Mm-hmm. Look, thanks for that, Una. Look, Una, thanks a million. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there, but I'll hopefully we'll we'll speak again, as they say. Hopefully, um, I just want to apologise to anyone that's watching. There was a couple of um, problems with my internet connection there, so there might have been a break early on in the uh, in, in the um, chat with Una there. But um, I think it's more most more or less okay, and I can see by there's plenty of comments here in support of you, Una. Um, uh, last but not least, um, if you've made it to the end um, and you want to support the channel subscribe or share the video or um there's an option in the chat and in the pinned comments to uh the buy me a coffee link uh to my website and stuff like that so uh we'll leave it at there leave it at that una and thank you and and thank you thank you thank you very much jerry for having me and also i just want to say thank you in advance to all those wonderful people if you if you said nice comments about me i just want to thank you for those i'm very (laughs) appreciative of them Okay, thanks, Una. Yeah, thank you very much, Jerry. Have a good evening. God bless.